This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. Straight ahead on the program, some key economic points for investors. I'm Tom Busby in New York. I'll have that story. I'm Stephen Carroll in London, where we're looking ahead to a quadruple bill of central bank decisions across Europe as policymakers try to push back on the idea that rate cuts are coming. I'm Doug Krisner, looking at China downshifting to a slower growth path. I'm Kaylee Lines in Washington, where Congress is getting ready to wrap up their work for 2023. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, the business news you need to wrap up your week. Available on Apple, Spotify, the Bloomberg Business app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby. We begin today's program with a big week for the economy. Not only will we get the Federal Reserve's final decision of the year on interest rates, we'll also get two key reports on inflation. To help us break it all down, we're pleased to welcome Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent Michael McKee and Bloomberg Intelligence Chief U.S. Rate Strategist Ira Jersey. Now let's start with those key data points coming on inflation with November's Consumer Price Index on Tuesday, the Producer Price Index on Wednesday. Ira, what are you expecting to see? We are uh, expecting a, a reasonably high core print, actually. And, and remember, core inflation uh, in CPI has been coming down pretty dramatically, but it looks like it might be in the process of stabilizing uh, just a little bit under 4%, which is obviously not a good sign for the Federal Reserve and uh, the idea that the Federal Reserve is going to uh, start cutting interest rates. And uh, so, so I think that's, that the CPI report is probably going to be the most meaningful report next week, at least for... Um, how the Fed reacts to, uh, to to the current inflationary environment. And this comes before the Fed, Michael. This is the uh, first day of the Fed meeting. It's Tuesday. Fed decision is on Wednesday. So it is new information for them that they will incorporate into their decision making. Uh, if the core doesn't move, it probably doesn't mean anything for this decision because the Fed has basically signaled they're going to stay on hold. The issue is, do we see something in the composition of the CPI that would suggest one way or another that it will again start falling or that it's going to stay where it is or even go up? Uh, one of the things that uh, we have been watching is, of course, housing and housing costs. And uh, they Fed has expected housing as a component of CPI to fall more than it has and uh, to slow more than it has. So if it doesn't move in this month, then uh, we might get Fed officials starting to worry that if housing is is not falling, that inflation is going to stall out. So that's something to watch in the CPI. And there is no sign of home prices declining anywhere. Pretty much. Well, we had home. I mean, it, of course, rental prices are are what dry, make up the CPI housing numbers, and they were going down. They have started to go back up again. They get into the CPI with a big lag, uh, sometimes as much as a year, and so. Uh, we don't know where we are in that lag process. We could see housing continue to fall for another couple of months before higher rates, uh, higher rental rates uh, start pushing it up again. So that's the open question for the Fed is they're, they're expecting this drop in housing and it hasn't happened yet. And housing is about 30 percent of the CPI. So it makes a big difference. Ira, where do you see the housing falling in and what other aspects of the CPI are going to be important to the Fed on Tuesday. Yeah, so what's interesting is we, we were just looking at this this past week with uh, Eric Edelberg, who's our mortgage strategist, and uh, and, and it, it is a, that 12-month lag between house prices and, and rental prices and uh, and the owner's equivalent rent component of CPI is, is about that right number. Um, and, you know, you've certainly seen, um, you know, a little bit of a moderation in, in things like rents, um, and and obviously that, that is one of the key components. But, but what I've been focused on in most of these reports, and and CPI in particular, um, but also the, the not as much retail sales, but in the overall consumer spending report, is what's going on in the services market, right? So, so there's a, been a big disconnect in CPI between food and energy prices, and then core goods, what we call core core goods. So that's goods excluding energy, and then uh, and core services. So again, it's services excluding energy services. And when when you look at that, service inflation continues to run at a pretty decent clip. It's really goods prices that have come moderated 
mitigated quite a lot with things like shipping costs coming back into, uh, you know, historical pre-pandemic kind of ranges. And uh, and also just, I, I think, just a somewhat slowing of demand for, for goods. But service prices uh, still remain reasonably high. So so I'm going to be focused on that stickier part of the CPI report and on, on inflation uh, on, on core services, even core services X housing, which some people call the super core. Um, so be, because th- that is has been sticky, right? And, and if that continues to run over 3%, then it's it's going to be more and more difficult for inflation to start coming down. In fact, you know, we've had Anna Wong on the Bloomberg Economics team has, has called this like, you know, the last the last mile, right? So getting this last like 100 basis points, 150 basis points lower in inflation is going to be much more difficult than the first, say, 5% was. And what do you see the next day in the PPI coming out? And, and I know uh, energy, very volatile this last week. Uh, is, uh, it wouldn't factor in to the November numbers, but how does that play in? Yeah, PPI is likely to be a bit lower than, than CPI because, remember, PPI doesn't take into as much, um, you know, the domestic services costs, right? So, so but, and CPI, uh, PPI final demand, you know, certainly has been slowing, but you haven't seen that necessarily correlate with consumer prices quite as much. You know, you know importantly, and I just want to go back to CPI just for half a second because I think the market pricing of CPI right now is really interesting because we've actually come off where, um, you know, for, for the next 10 years, the market's only expecting 2.2% uh, inflation, uh, CPI inflation over the next decade. So so the so for the Fed, the market pricing certainly is not a concern. Of course, the, the market did a bad job in predicting the big run-up in 2022 inflation. Um, uh, there was the market was very late to that party, but but nonetheless, people aren't going in and buying a ton of inflation hedges right now. That you know, most of the uh, m- most market participants seem to be pretty sanguine on on the inflationary environment. And both CPI and PPI this week, if they come in kind of at or slightly below expectations, is certainly going to be very good for uh, for the Treasury market. And you're going to see uh, you know probably a pretty good rally in, in Treasuries. Wow. Now we have uh, CPI, PPI, and we move to the FOMC also coming ahead this week. We did a lot of acronyms for you. (laughs) That's right. Thank you for setting that up. Two meetings in a row, keeping the benchmark lending rate unchanged. What are you expecting the central bank policymakers to do? Why don't we start with Michael? Well, I think the key thing that they're going to do is they put out their new economic forecasts, which lead to their new uh, rate forecasts and what the market's really going to want to the first thing the market's going to want to know after whether they moved or not and they're not expected to move is what does the dot plot say about 2024 right now we got five rate moves priced in by the futures market and about that in the swaps market and the fed had said in september that we'd see a rate cut or two next year so there's a big difference between what the fed had been seeing and what the market now sees so does the fed Uh, adopt the market view that they'll be cutting rates a lot next year or do they stick with the idea that uh, they're not going to cut rates a whole lot Uh, that plot shows where the fed thinks rates will be at the end of the year so it won't give a clue about the timing unless there were multiple rate cuts in there then uh, people would start to try to figure out when they would do those uh, to get uh, the, the most bang out of the buck. We'll also see, um, to pick up on what Ira was saying, we'll see their new forecasts for inflation, and we'll see whether they think inflation is going to be coming down or remain sticky. Ira? Yeah, the SCP, I agree, is probably going to be the most interesting thing. In fact, the, the Treasury market, uh, again, I do point you to a piece that we did just this past week um, about when the market moves during Fed days, and it really moves the most when you get the summary of economic projections and the dreaded dot plot. So so if the dots move significantly, uh, both for the 2024 dot and also potentially the longer run dot, if, if a, either of those medians move meaningfully from where they were during the September uh, summer of economic projection, um, you know, I think we can reprice a lot of uh, a lot of the rates markets reprice for uh, for cuts uh, and 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 or hikes. Uh, you know, I continue to th- to be of the belief that the Federal Reserve is going to probably start cutting later than what the market's priced. 
So the market will likely continue to price for cuts sometime within the next, say, at the third meeting out from wherever we are until they actually start cutting, um, even if those cuts are not materialized. So, so that creates an opportunity for investors to kind of fade that type of activity. Um, now, that doesn't mean necessarily that you know long-term yields necessarily need to sell off and you wind up seeing 10-year yields at 5% again or anything like that. But it does mean that, um, that, that the shape of the curve could shift a little bit where some of the, the, the recent uh, what we call bull steepening, so two-year yields going down faster than 10-year yields, some of that might reverse a little bit, especially if, if we're right and the Federal Reserve kind of takes some of, the, uh, some of these cuts that are being priced off the table. And, and Jay Powell could do that. Well, our thanks to Bloomberg International Economics and policy correspondent Michael McKee and Bloomberg Intelligence Chief U.S. Rate Strategist Ira Jersey. Coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, the Fed not the only one making an interest rate decision. Up next, we'll take you to Europe to preview two key central bank decisions. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Up later in our program, a look at the health of the Chinese economy. But first, we just previewed the upcoming Federal Reserve decision. It's also a big week ahead for central banks in Europe, with both the Bank of England and the European Central Bank meeting on Thursday. Market bets on rate cuts by policymakers in London and Frankfurt have been ramping up. But there's more data coming in that could temper that enthusiasm. For more, let's go to London and bring in Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor Stephen Carroll. Tom, we're set for a quadruple bill of central bank meetings on Thursday in Europe. Monetary policy decisions expected in the UK, the euro area, Switzerland and Norway. Now, although no interest rate changes are expected, given the ramping up of market bets over when the first cuts will come and how much central banks will cut by in 2024, every word will be parsed for signs of whether policymakers will be taking some festive cheer from the recent data. In the euro area, the headline inflation rate has slowed faster than expected to 2.4% in November. I've been looking ahead to the ECB and Bank of England decisions with our chief Europe economist, Jamie Rush. I started by asking him if, given the slowing inflation in the euro area, the ECB can consider its rate hiking mission a success. Well, I think, I think the answer is kind of yes and no. So if you look at it in kind of broad strokes, then yeah, the ECB's basically done its job. So underlying inflation has been falling back for pretty much the last six months. Um, the economy is pretty weak. There's wage growth pretty weak as well. So, I mean, what more is there to do? They've, they've raised rates substantially. It's having an effect. Um, but I think when you look at the, when you dig into the detail, we are going to see over the next few months that it's quite a bumpy trajectory for inflation as energy support measures are withdrawn and as base effects kind of have an impact on, on the December readings. We're going to see actually inflation is probably going to go back up to about 3.2% next month. And within, of course, the, the the 20 countries in the euro area as well, are there ones that we could worry about that will drive part of that potential uptick inflation if it's going to come back to a slightly higher level? Well, I think we're, we're immediately going to see that inflation is going to jump to 4% in Germany. Uh, and in Spain, we will see a, a similar size increase as well. So heading towards 4.5% over the coming months. And again, it's to do with that energy withdrawal stuff. And Germany hasn't even set its budget for next year. That creates another risk. They have to they have to kind of pull the rug under energy support measures even more, and that's going to push up inflation as as energy bills go up. So there there is this kind of very near term risk around around the path for inflation, and, and that could actually mean that the ECB is a little bit more cautious than people are expecting. What about the impact of the rate hikes on? the economic performance of these countries. We've had data in the past few days, particularly looking at Germany's manufacturing sector, industrial production, weaker than expected, factory orders, weaker than expected as well. How much of the the pain has already been inflicted on these economies or is there more to come? Well, I mean, industrial production in Germany is exceptionally weak and is going to drag on the economy, maybe take about 0.4% off the level of GDP in the fourth quarter. So that's that's quite a lot. Um, but I think when, when you look at what the models tell us the impact of monetary policy should be, it tells us that the hiking cycle should take about 4% off the level of GDP. Uh, and we haven't seen that yet. So I think we're probably somewhere around about halfway through the transmission of that. 
Um, and actually, the real mystery is why the economy has held up so well, not not why it's so weak. So, um, you know, that's actually one of the things that we're puzzling over as economists is, is why interest rates haven't tanked the economy in the way you'd expect. Yeah, and of course, that's part of the dilemma facing central bankers as well. The markets are getting very excited already about interest rate cuts, particularly from the ECB. How far away do you see them as being? Well, I, I think I think market pricing is probably a little bit overdone. Um, the the idea that you would raise interest rates as much as central banks have done and then immediately start cutting and we have to it just seems it seems a bit implausible to me I and mean, i think it was des- described as as fiction by one of the cent- the ecb yeah peter delicate. casimir is saying exactly. si- science fiction in fact si- dismal science fiction perhaps <laughs> um so yeah it's kind of um i, I think it I think given that what the motives for the hikes, the hikes were to guard against persistent inflation. We haven't yet seen that that is completely under control. I'd be really surprised if the ECB jumps the gun. So how, in your timing-wise, when do you see the first rate cut happening? So I, I think um, I think March, I mean, we're going to finish our Christmas dinners and it's <laughs> going to be March. So I think that's probably too soon. Um, we, our our January, forecast yeah. is for the first cut in June. There's plenty of like ground... Um, ground laying before then you know there's a risk that if the economy turns out weaker than expected or inflation takes another dive down then that could come a little bit sooner than june should expect that data dependency mantra to stay let's think about the bank of england then Uh, how different is the situation facing andrew bailey and colleagues in london versus those in frankfurt i think it's completely different as has been as was kind of pretty clear from the outset here the the eurozone didn't have the wages problem that the UK has. I mean, wages were growing at 7 8% in the UK. That just has not been a feature of the Eurozone labour market. Uh, that has created this huge uh, influence on the kind of second round effects on, on inflation in the UK. So Bank of England has a bigger problem. They've had to hike rates by a bit more. They felt compelled to. And, and therefore, they're going to have to cut a little bit later as well. I mean, and that's, I think that's an inevitability. So what, what about the inflation trajectory for the UK? Is there the risk of the same bump, bumpy trajectory from here when we think about where, where things are looking into next year? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, we're going to see bumps along the way. But again, the general picture, I think, is downward. We have some things which we know are pushing down, like and the kind of withdrawal, the energy price shock mm. is obviously passing through the economy. Goods inflation, that's coming down as well. So, you know, things are kind of moving in the right direction. I mean, the big question is what happens to services because of this wages problem. And we know that in the services sector, wages is a huge part of the costs. And so that is probably what the Bank of England is going to be focusing on uh, to be as a measure of whether it's done its job and whether the rates can come down. Looking at the trajectory for wages, though, as well, d- does that mean that we will see more real terms wage increases as inflation slows, but perhaps the momentum remains behind inflation or wage growth? Uh, yeah, I mean, as price, if prices start to f- fall, then then yeah, we will start to see that real incomes are recovering. Um, I mean, prices haven't really changed a huge amount for the past six months. You know, think about when the actual energy price shock hits. I mean, we've all started, we've all paid, the level of prices is up, that hasn't changed. The, le- the high level of prices is going to be something that stays with us. The inflation rate will come down a bit, but that's not going to provide a huge amount of support to spending. So, so we'll see, I, I, I think it's, it's unlikely that as inflation heads down, we're going to get a huge revival of consumption, especially with um, uncertainty out the outlook about as it is. That was our chief Europe economist, Jamie Rush. I've also been getting a market's perspective on this from Daniel Casali, who's an investment strategist at Evelyn Partners. We talked about how markets are processing the expectations of rate cuts. And I started by asking him when he expects to see the ECB move. It's likely to happen probably in the first half of uh, next year or maybe possibly later. It's really a question or cat and mouse here between who cuts first. Is it the US or is it the ECB? Uh, I think the main message here is the fact that interest rates have certainly peaked and likely to come down. And that probably means that the risk of an economic hard landing where central banks raise rates too aggressively is probably significantly reduced. And that the likelihood is now that we may now have a, a soft economic landing, which means probably uh, less likelihood of a recession. So how does that look then for your outlook for investment opportunities? If, if the soft landing narrative is taking hold, how do you think you're going to see opportunities in the first half of next year? Well, I think if we do have this uh, soft landing, which means growth holds up and also the fact that you might have lower inflation, along with the possibility of interest rate cuts, it probably means we might get some of that rotation coming out of, uh, say, the AI theme into other areas of the market. In other words, a broadening out of the market. And that could include things like small cap and unloved areas such as energy. Uh, it still means that the overall equity market would still 
likely increase because it'll start to price in less risk of an economic hard landing. Uh, so it does tell us that if we do have a soft economic landing, uh, it's probably going to be constructive stocks. So that was Daniel Casali, investment strategist at Evelyn Partners, speaking to me on Bloomberg Radio. And of course, we will have full coverage of all of these central bank decisions this week. I'm Stephen Carroll in London. You can catch us every weekday morning here for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London and 1am on Wall Street. Tom? Our thanks to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor Stephen Carroll. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we take you to Asia to see how the Chinese economy is doing in this post-COVID world. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Tom Busby in New York with your global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. The Chinese economy struggling this year in its post-COVID recovery. For months, the optimists have been hoping for signs of a turning point. Could there be a glimmer of improvement in the week ahead? Bloomberg Daybreak Asia co-host Doug Krisner has a preview. Tom, it's been tough to make the case that the worst is over for the Chinese economy. Just last week, Moody's cut its outlook for Chinese sovereign bonds to negative. Now, the firm pointed to risk, like the use of debt to support local governments, as well as a spiraling downturn in the property market. In the coming week, Beijing will be reporting monthly economic activity for the month of November. So we'll have industrial production and retail sales among the data points. Both of those figures are expected to rise from October levels. What are these readings really telling us? Well, let's ask Eric Zhu. He is Bloomberg's economist covering China and Hong Kong. Eric joins us from our studios in Hong Kong. Eric, thanks for being with us. Obviously, the economy is facing many problems right now, but I'm wondering if all of this fits under the, the broad heading of weak sentiment. Is that the biggest problem right now affecting China? I think, yeah, I think, uh, you know, in terms of data, I can start with, you know, next week's uh, activity data. I think uh, the headline number will look quite rosy. It's uh, accelerating from October, but uh, we probably we don't need to read too much into those year-on-year figures. But remember, we have a very uh, depressed level last year when China was struggling, you know, at the uh, initial of COVID reopening. So I think it's more, what would be more interesting we are, will be watched for is the month-on-month figures probably for next week's reading. So are you talking about retail sales here or industrial yeah. production or both? I think both will be accelerating on year-on-year numbers, but that won't tell you much about the underlying so weak momentum. If you look at PMI data, if you look at those high-frequency numbers we are tracking, actually we will see production and both consumption still looks quite weak in November, even considering we have some working day boost compared to the holiday in October. So, yeah, so you might see a quite strong headline uh, year-on-year figures, but uh, that doesn't tell you the underlying truth. We'll also get data on fixed asset investment, and we know that the story with direct or foreign direct investment, it's down sharply, and that's an area that President yeah. Xi yeah. attempted to address during the recent APEC summit. How difficult will it be to get foreign capital to flow back into China? Uh, I think it's a big ask, and uh, I think the government still needs, I think the President Xi mentioned in his U.S. trip that uh, the government will think about, will implement more heartwarming, right, the so-called heartwarming measures to uh, attract investors back to China. But I think it's a, it's a couple of reasons why it's it's quite difficult right now. So, so some obvious challenge is, you know, the geopolitical risk is rising. So I think for some foreign business, it's it's uh, not investing in China is not only it's, it's not purely you know business or economy decision. It's sometimes also a political decision, right? We hear some business that they are forced out of at least partially you know out of China. It's not only it's not re- entirely a business decision. But so I think on that front, China probably it's it's China cannot do much about that because it's not purely you know something China can control. But uh, at the same time, we think what China can can do what China can boost those confidence is uh, they try to promote growth in in China right they, they have to you know lift the overall sentiment the including both uh, market and also household business sentiment overall and uh, 
if the China can bring those growth, a healthy and a, a more sustainable long-term growth back, I think uh, the business would uh, still see opportunity in China. We'll also get the jobless figure, and this is interesting because for several months now, Beijing has not been reporting youth unemployment, and I mm-hmm. believe the last time we had a reading, it was well above 20%. Obviously, mm-hmm. that's a major issue, and I think for many in the government, deeply concerning. Is there any way that the government can address this problem? Are they doing something about it? Yeah, I think that right now I heard a story that uh, you know some some local governments they are uh, they are tasked with creating some maybe temporary job opportunities for for those young people, fresh graduates. They can you know get some uh, some some jobs in local level, very local level. You know those townships, those village uh, of government. It's not well paid, but still that gives them some opportunity at least to delay those unemployment, right? So trying to give some more experience. But I think that's something the government trying to stabilize in the near term. But I think in the longer term, it's uh, that they have to think hard about what's, what would be the opportunities for those young people. So when you look at the trade story, I'm wondering the extent to which the slowdown that's happening globally in, in many economies, whether you're talking about uh, developed economies, let's say Europe, the United States, to a lesser extent, Australia, whether the weakness there that's manifesting is is contributing to a, a significant drag in the export space for China, is it? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, this year it's a hardship for the exporters in China. I think uh, uh, the, the external demand has been quite weak. And given our expectation that global economy will further slow down next year, I don't think we're going to see a very uh, a quick pickup in trade in exports uh, in the near term. Of course, the headline numbers might get uh, better. That's again, that's some basic facts due to a low levels last year. But I think uh, if you look at the months and months, look at sequential momentum, we haven't seen a very uh, strong signal that uh, those uh, foreign uh, those shipping orders, those uh, foreign demand are picking up. Quickly. When you look at the property sector, it accounts for about 20% of GDP. I don't know whether that figure will be consistent as we move into the new year, but do you see anything that can be done to turn around the property market that the government could still do that it hasn't done already? First of all, I don't think it's a government's target that to turn around the property market. I think that's, that's initiated by the government. They're trying to reduce the reliance of the economy on property sector. I think at the height, it's like one twenty-five percent, one quarter of the economy, it's already down to like twenty percent this year, and the progress will continue uh, to re- uh, to be reduced. I think that's a long-term or medium-term goal of the government that right? they try to make economy rely less on property and also uh, reducing the financial risk uh, related to property bubbles. But uh, the thing is, you rely less on property, and what other sectors you can find out to fill the holes left by property. Well, I'm confused because if the PBOC is lowering interest rates largely to help lower mortgage rates, isn't there some acknowledgement that the property market, a recovery in the property market is necessary as a way of improving sentiment and then helping to support growth? No, I don't. I don't think the market rates is helping much. I think that the, the fundamental problem in the property market is that people are losing, you know, uh, confidence. That they, they don't think the market in a booming at all. So in the longer term, in the medium term, they're expecting more correction in the market. Prices will further drop. So no one is willing to enter market right now, even if there's some um, real demand, you know, for for property. So I think. Uh, you know, uh, lower mortgage rates. You know, uh, relaxing those purchase rules. It's not going. To, it's going to help on the margin, but probably won't help much. It's not because people people are not buying because the costs are too high. People are not buying just they they they, are, they no longer you know have confidence in the market. So before I let you go, I want to ask you about the new year, 2024. Is it going to be a repeat of what we have seen in 23? Uh, so far, I would say we haven't seen a big game changer for next year. So our baseline would be like China continue to model through. 
also with some public increase of public investment stimulus trying to offset the drag from mitigate the drag from property slump. So we, we, we haven't seen a big confidence lifter so far, but the wishful thinking is the government can come up with, you know, more substantial, you know, measures to trying to recover, uh, revive those confidence and sentiment. That would be a help a lot. Eric, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, helping us set up the week ahead for the Chinese economy. Eric Zhu is a Bloomberg economist covering uh, China and Hong Kong, joining us from our studios in Hong Kong. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself weekdays here for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, beginning at 7 a.m. in Hong Kong, 6 p.m. on Wall Street. Tom? Our thanks to Bloomberg Daybreak Asia co-host Doug Krisner. And coming up here on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, it's the last week of work for Congress before the holiday break. Can that body get anything accomplished by year's end? I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Still a few weeks left in the year, but not for Congress, with just one final week of work before the holiday break. Can lawmakers get anything done this week? Well, for more, let's head to our Bloomberg 99.1 newsroom in Washington and Bloomberg Sound On co-host, Kaylee Lines. Yeah, Tom, the end of the working year is coming quickly for Congress, as both the House and the Senate will go home for the holidays late this coming week. And it's not really clear whether they'll be able to accomplish much with their last few days in Washington of 2023. Joining us now with more is Megan Scully, who helps lead Bloomberg's congressional coverage. So, Megan, they have a lot left on their to-do list, supplemental funding, a border security deal that perhaps needs to go with that in order for Ukraine and Israeli to get through. You have to try to get maybe some appropriations matters buttoned up so you don't have a shutdown. Does any of that have a material chance of being accomplished before they go home for their holiday break? I think the appropriations matters are effectively shelved until January. The focus right now is on Ukraine and the border security package that that they're trying to meld together. But even that seems unlikely uh, of getting through both chambers before they leave for the congressional recess. One of uh, one leading House Republican at the end of the week said he, he thought the chances were near zero that that would actually get done. Well, so it becomes a question of whether it can get done at all if it doesn't happen in 2023. How much harder or easier will it be to get done in 2024? I think the key to all of this is Speaker Mike Johnson. There's been so much talk about Senate Democrats and Republicans negotiating a deal on border security, which is not related to Ukraine at all, but would unlock the Ukraine funding, essentially. We get a deal on the border, then we can move on on Ukraine and, and one big package. In the House, though, it is much trickier. You have ultra conservatives, the hardliners who threw out former Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who oppose Ukraine aid. And they've said, they could maybe go along with it or at least turn a blind eye to it if they pass the border first and if the border if they see a significant reduction in border crossings that means that would take time and that would mean ukraine aid would pass much later there's plenty of support in the house for getting ukraine aid over the finish line but Does Speaker Johnson want to risk his job by infuriating his right flank in order to do so? Well, that I feel like is always the question we've (laughs) asked, especially when he passed a continuing resolution early on in his speakership with Democratic support, which is basically the exact same thing that Kevin McCarthy got ousted because of. Also interesting that now it seems we're back to this idea when we think about appropriations of the debt ceiling deal from what, six months ago, actually being the top line numbers we're going to go with. (laughs) Speaker Johnson sent out a Dear Colleague letter this past week that said it's the law of the land, the Fiscal Responsibility Act. So even if this Ukraine and border stuff is getting harder, does that actually mean the actual budget might be easier because we're going to stick with the top line numbers we already agreed to? We're still early yet. We have six weeks to go. You know, it's a two step shutdown, right? We have the January 19th for, for many of the federal agencies, but the defense department, which is half of all federal discretionary spending, doesn't actually shut down until February 2nd. I think that there's a lot of time for things to go right or 
looking at this Congress go wrong in the next <laughs> six weeks. And the devil's going to be in the details in terms of coming to an agreement. Even if they can agree to adhere to those top line levels, and, and it seems as though even the far, hard right is willing to go along with that right now, it's a matter of where that money actually goes program mm-hmm. by program. And that's where we could see the fight really start to percolate in January. All right. Megan Scully, who helps lead Bloomberg's congressional coverage, not sure we are feeling much more optimistic after this conversation that stuff's going to get done before the year is over. But 2024 is always somewhat of a new start. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Tom, happy almost new year, I guess. Thank you, Kaylee. That was Bloomberg Sound On co-host Kaylee Lines reporting from our Bloomberg 991 newsroom in Washington. And you can hear Sound On weekdays, 1 to 3 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg Radio. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend. Join us again Monday morning at 5 a.m. Wall Street time for the latest on the markets overseas and the news you need to start your day. I'm Tom Busby. Stay with us. Top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.